Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come, Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to be talking about the introductory pages of the Book of Mormon. Basically, we're talking about all the information before 1 Nephi chapter 1. And so the first thing we're going to cover is the title page. Now, this is a literal translation. This was written by Moroni, and Joseph Smith himself said that the title page is not by any means a modern composition, either of mine or of any other man who has lived or does live in this generation. And so this being the last leaf in the Book of Mormon, the title page was most likely written by Moroni right before he put the plates in the ground back when he lived. And this title page is important because it covers the purpose of the Book of Mormon. It's the mission statement, why the Book of Mormon came to be. And after the title page, we read the introduction to the Book of Mormon. This was written by the Scripture Publication Committee, headed by Elder Monson, Packer, and McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve, back between the years of 1979 and 1981. And so the introduction to the Book of Mormon is a modern composition. This is an invitation to everybody of our day to read the Book of Mormon, to ponder the message that it contains, and to ask God if this is true. Now, this introduction has been edited. If you go to the second paragraph of the introduction, we read this, that after thousands of years, all were destroyed except the Lamanites, and they are among the ancestors of the American Indians. And that part in the second paragraph is a modern edit clarifying our understanding of the relationship that the Nephites and the Lamanites had with all of the indigenous people of North and South America. Because in 1979, the general assumption amongst members of the church was that all of the indigenous people were descendants of Lehi and his people. Today, we understand that there were many diverse groups in the Americas when Lehi and his colony arrived, and that they are part of a grander scope or a grander picture of the varied peoples of ancient America. Because the bottom line is, there were many diverse groups in the Americas when Lehi got here, and the Book of Mormon itself shows us this if we read the text carefully and we look for it as we go. And so in these podcasts, we will be discussing the evidences of other groups in and around Lehi's colony during the time when the Book of Mormon took place. There's so many of these, but let me just give you one example. If you remember, Jacob is Nephi's brother, and he arrives with Lehi's colony when they get to the Americas. Now, if you go to Jacob chapter 7, and this is Jacob's account, he says that he meets this fellow named Sherem chapter 7, verse 1, that there was a man that came among the people of Nephi, and his name was Sherem. And he had hope, in verse 5, to shake me from the faith. This is Jacob talking about Sherem's goal. And here's what happens. Verse 6, we read, it came to pass that he, Sherem, came unto me, and on this wise did he speak unto me, saying, Brother Jacob, I have sought much opportunity that I might speak unto you, for I have heard and also know that thou goest about much preaching that which ye call the gospel or the doctrine of Christ. Okay, time out. What's going on? Well, here's this guy who's outside of Lehi's group. He's not one of Lehi's sons. He's heard about Jacob. Jacob's fame has spread, and Sherem finally says, listen, I've sought much to finally come and talk to you, and now I get to come and approach you, and I'm going to try to dismantle your faith in Jesus. Well, Sherem clearly is outside of Lehi's group. And so to me, this is one illustration of many, that there were many different diverse groups in the Americas when Lehi got to the Americas. He did not come to this land and it was devoid of all humanity, but he came and he was injected into many different groups, divergent groups, in my opinion, that existed in the Americas. And Sherem is one example, because remember, Jacob is the, of the first generation of the people that got off the boat in Lehi's colony. 
So that was a little bit of a rabbit hole just on one little phrase in the second paragraph of the introduction to the Book of Mormon. But that's just an example of how the introduction as a modern composition is doing its best to express what the Book of Mormon's doing, and it's written to a modern audience. So let's go back to the introductory pages. Now, after the introduction, the next part is the testimony of the three witnesses. And these three witnesses are Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris. And these individuals saw an angel, they saw the plates, and they heard the voice of the Lord. So this is an example of three individuals that have a spiritual experience seeing the plates and an angel and hearing the voice of God in their testimony of the Book of Mormon. And all three of these individuals to their dying day testified that the book is true. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the podcast. And after the testimony of the three witnesses, we read the testimony of the eight witnesses. The testimony of the eight witnesses is very much a physical evidence witness. They say that we have seen and hefted and know of a surety that the plates existed. They write that it had the appearance of gold and that Joseph Smith showed them to them, and they were able to pick them up, see them, and they're basically witnessing to the world that the plates existed. And so, in my opinion, the difference between these two sets of witnesses are spiritual and physical evidence. On one hand, we have a very modern physical witness. Hey, we've seen and hefted the plates. And then on the other hand, from the three witnesses, we have more of a spiritual evidence We've seen an angel, we've heard the voice of the Lord, and we've seen the plates. After that, we read the testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith, and this is in Joseph Smith's own words, written in 1838, and he basically is telling us the story of how when he was 17, he prayed, and an angel appeared to him and explained to him what the Book of Mormon was and what Joseph's role was in the restoration and bringing forth the Book of Mormon from antiquity into the modern world. And Joseph Smith played a pivotal role in this because he was the translator. And so this is a brief account of what his experience was and his conclusion of his testimony is the importance of the record because as he was translating it, there were many individuals who exerted, quote, most strenuous exertions to get the plates from him. And he says, every stratagem that could be invented was resorted for that purpose, the purpose of trying to stop the Book of Mormon from coming to light. And so his testimony, in my opinion, really does illustrate this idea that there's forces of light and darkness that exist in this world. And the Book of Mormon is, one of its purposes is to show us the light and to show us what's at stake. If we read the book, we will see light and we will come to Christ. And now the last part of the introductory pages is a brief explanation about the Book of Mormon. And so last week I geeked out a lot about the structure of the Book of Mormon. We get into some details that you probably would never get into in a classroom. Things like, okay, why does Nephi write two sets of plates? What is the difference between the large and the small plates of Nephi? And why did he put those in there? And then we discuss what is known as the plates of Mormon, which is really an abridgment of many different sets of plates, war records, historical documents, letters, and uh, many discourses that Mormon edits and he puts together and it's rich and it's complex. And Mormon, over the course of his life, is able to redact and edit and abridge many different documents and put it into one document. We talk about that. That's why it's called the Book of Mormon, that Mormon is doing the heavy lifting of putting this together, but he's also inserting Nephi's small plates that he's not editing. And we kind of show you this as we go through that last week. And then we talk about how Moroni brings into and incorporates the record of ether. And then also, obviously, the brass plates. Why were the brass plates important? Why did Lehi bring them with him across the ocean? And what is some of the differences between the brass plates and the modern Old Testament that we read today. So the Book of Mormon really is covering about a thousand years of history. It covers from the time period of Nephi around 600 BC all the way to 400 AD, but it really spans an even greater time period if we throw in the account of the Jaredites. Whenever the Jaredites crossed, whenever that was, and I certainly don't know, 
But whenever they came to the Americas, the Book of Ether puts that timeline way, way back. But in general, I think it's really safe to say that the Book of Mormon covers about 1,000 years, from 600 BC when Nephi leaves to 400 AD when the plates and the record is concluded and Moroni puts them in the ground. So there's lots of good stuff in these introductory pages, and this was just a brief overview. So now let's jump back to the title page. And if you skip down to the second paragraph of the title page, remember, this is what Moroni wrote. He gives us the purpose statement of the Book of Mormon, which is to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers, and that they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast off forever. And also to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. And so, Bryce, what can you teach us about Jesus Christ manifesting himself unto all nations? We almost always put a period there. So often as I hear the title page quoted, they say, you know, the Book of Mormon was written to convince Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, period. Or Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, period. And it certainly does do that. Uh, the, the Book of Mormon will convince you that Jesus is the Messiah, but why would a Latter-day Saint who already knows Jesus is the Messiah read the Book of Mormon then? Notice it's not a period. It's a comma. One of the greatest contributions of the Book of Mormon isn't just to show that Jesus is the Christ, but to show what Jesus does. What is his purpose? What will he do in your life? Let's begin as big and as wide and as broad as we possibly can. The Book of Mormon will show you that Jesus will manifest himself unto all nations, every nation. So think Book of Mormon for a moment. Is there a nation in the Book of Mormon to which Jesus does not manifest himself? He manifests himself to every nation. The Jews are mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Does Jesus manifest himself to the Jews? Yep. Nephites, yep. Lamanites, yep. Mulekites, yep. Does he manifest himself to the Jaredites? Yep. Now, if that's true, then Jesus is going to manifest himself to your nation, wherever you live. If you live in Colombia, if you live in Belize, if you live in Iraq, if you live in Russia or China, Jesus will manifest himself to every nation. That's the testimony of the Book of Mormon. But let's peel off one layer. What's smaller than a nation? Well, in the United States, we would say that a state, I live in the state of Utah. I'm in the nation of the United States, but I live in the state of Utah. But in the scriptures, we wouldn't use the title state. We would say something like a kindred, tongue, or a people. So turn with me to Alma chapter 26. And watch the Book of Mormon peel back that layer, and let's go to a smaller group. Now, the setting here is significant. This is the Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni, or the conclusion of their mission, and they are rejoicing in what God did to a group of the Lamanites, not the whole nation. The whole nation was not converted. But what did God do to a group of the Lamanites? And he says in the very last verse, verse 37, and now, my brethren, we see that God is mindful of every people. Whatsoever land they may be in, he numbereth his people, his bowels of mercy are over all the earth. Now this is my joy and my thanksgiving, which means he is mindful of my people. He's mindful of my family. He's mindful of the people with whom I associate. No matter where you live on this earth, he is mindful of your people. But again, I'm not a people. I'm a person. I'm one individual. So let's peel back one layer, and let's get to that individual layer. So now let's go to Mosiah chapter 27, which again, the setting is very significant. It's the story of one individual, Alma, a rebellious young man who was going about trying to destroy the church, and then God kind of comes and strikes him down. He goes into a little bit of a trance a little bit, and then he wakes up, and then he says in verse 30, which I would suggest here is the message of the Book of Mormon in one verse. Alma stands up and says, Hey, I rejected my Redeemer, and I denied that which had been spoken by our fathers, but now that they may foresee that he will come, and that he remembereth every creature 
of his creating. And then he ties us back to that first one. He will make himself manifest unto all. The testimony of the Book of Mormon at its very root is that God remembers every creature of his creating and will manifest himself to every single individual. God remembers you. If you remembered Alma, if you remembered Alma's dad, if you remembered Amulek or Lamoni or Lamoni's dad, the whole Book of Mormon seems to be the story of people who God could easily have justified what forgetting, who at one point either fought against him or didn't care about him. Amulek will say, I always knew, yet I would not know. And yet God remembered. He remembers you. Now let's peel back one more layer. Let's go smaller than a person. What's smaller than a person? A little person. A little person. A child. A hobbit. (laughs) Go to 3 Nephi chapter 17. What does Jesus do to each and every child? 3 Nephi chapter 17, verse 21. He takes each child one by one and... He blesses them. And I just, with all my soul, I know he didn't say the same thing to each child. So let me just emphasize that. Jesus has a blessing for you. Jesus prays to the Father that his blessing for you will be granted. I like that verse where it says that he took them one by one. One by one. So Jesus manifests himself unto every nation— is mindful of every people, remembers every creature of his creating, and blesses and prays for each one, including the children. And the Book of Mormon stands as a witness. It starts when Jesus remembers Lehi. He remembers Nephi. He even remembers Zoram. He remembers Laman and Lemuel. He remembers everyone. It's like a golden thread that's woven throughout the text. Of course, The authors want us to know that it's only in and through Christ that we're saved, but then they also reveal his character. And I like that. I mean, if you only had 10 minutes to teach the Book of Mormon, that's a good 10 minutes of, hey, this is who he is. And the Book of Mormon is preparing us for the temple, and the temple is where Jesus makes himself manifest in the Book of Mormon. And if you read the Doctrine and Covenants, it's happening there. There's always this continual invitation come into my presence. And we'll see this symbolically, of course, when we get to the tree of life. And if you listen to the Revelation podcast, we saw that all through the text of the book of Revelation. So it's this invitation to come. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just talk a little bit about method of translation. And I've done some work on the history of this, looking through the primary sources. And so a lot of this, I've done my best to cite primary sources on the method of translation, because our enemies do a lot to make a great deal of uh, about nothing or what I like to call they produce a nothing burger. And here's why we can't attack the text of the book of Mormon that that's impenetrable, but we'll attack the method of translation. So let's talk about uh, what the enemies say. And first the enemies say Joseph Smith looked in a hat to translate the book of Mormon. Now, if you click on book of Mormon translation under gospel topics and the gospel topics essays, it will talk about this. It will talk about that Joseph Smith did do this. What I wanted to do is just put this in context of history. And so the first thing I'm going to do is cover a timeline. And this is pretty much something that all people agree on. Even apostates can't argue that this is the timeline. Yeah, They can't claim that, oh, all of this is made up, that this is established historical fact This is kind of ground zero for everyone. We all accept this timeline. Good, good. Yeah, that's that's really important. So whether you're an enemy of the church or not, uh, it's reported that September 21st, 1823, Joseph Smith, 17, and he's told, hey, you're going to get this record. He doesn't receive it until 1827 on September 22nd. Which means he's 21 years old. He's a young man. He's married. Uh, this is Mike Day Midrash. I think Joseph's marriage is integral to this process. Uh, Joseph doesn't say it. Uh, this is just my reading of Judaism and, and ancient texts. There was this notion in antiquity that a man was not authorized to be an official like spokesman of the Torah to speak and to pontificate on these things until he was married. And I could be dead wrong. But Joseph is married by September 22nd, 1827. 
and he receives the plates. From October to December of 1827, he moves due to persecution. He moves to a place called Harmony, Pennsylvania with his wife. Where M is from. Near her family, 100 miles away from his hometown, and Martin Harris gives him $50 to kind of work on the translation. So from January to February in 1828, Emma scribes and he translates. And then from February to March, Martin Harris visits Charles Anthon in New York City. Now, that's significant. Charles Anthon is an expert on languages. Martin Harris brings him a portion of the text that was written on the plates, and Charles Anthon uh, validates it and says, this is ancient stuff. Once Martin knows this, he is set to mortgage his farm to make it so the publication of the Book of Mormon can come forth. I'm skipping a lot of history. There's a lot going on with Charles Anthon, but just know that after whatever it was that Charles Anthon told Martin Harris, historically, we know Martin Harris is on board. He's ready to help in any way he can. So he believes Joseph, and on April 12th of 1828, he scribes for Joseph. In June of 1828, so it's been a couple months, there's 116 pages that's produced. And that text, Martin says, he wants to take it and show it to his family. That's where we're going to get section 5 and section 10 of the Doctrine and Covenants. 3 and 10. Yeah, thank you, 3 and 10. Uh, Historically, Martin takes the 116 pages. We don't know where it goes. It's gone. And Joseph loses the ability to translate. What I mean by that is June 14th, the text is taken. June 15th, Alvin Smith is born to Emma and Joseph, and Alvin, their son, dies that day. So talk about a depressing time period. In July, Joseph heads to Palmyra to talk to Martin, and Martin tells him, I've lost the manuscript, and Joseph thinks all is lost. So from July to September of that year, uh, Joseph doesn't have the gift of translation. Moroni takes the plates. Section 3 of the Doctrine and Covenants is received. After some repentance and humbling himself, in September of that year, he gets the plates. He translates a little bit in the winter from February to March of 1829, and he's told to wait. On April 5th, 1829, Oliver Cowdery, who's a school teacher, shows up in Harmony, Pennsylvania, and he, he scribes for Joseph. So the bulk of the Book of Mormon is translated from April to June. Starting on April 7th is when translation resumes in full force, and it's completely translated by June 30th, April, May, and June. Three months to translate the entire text. What historians would say is about eight pages a day. Now, I've done some translation, and I think, Bryce, you've done some too. You know languages. Talk to me about eight pages a day. There's no way. Um, That is like full speed ahead. That is like going as fast as a translator could possibly go. Yeah. I think eight one page pages is, a day. Yeah, I think one is really ambitious. And, and so this is this is my contention. And I wasn't there, but we're doing the podcast and I'm just going to tell you what I think. Heaven's doing this. There's help from heaven and from the accounts we read, Joseph is given the words. Uh, however you want to view that. So when we talk about method of translation, here's the big picture. Prior to the loss of the 116 pages, Joseph is using the two small stones in silver bows. He's going to call that the Yerman Thummim. He also has a, a rock, a stone that's like chocolate colored. He sometimes calls that the Yerman Thummim. And so that's why historically it can get kind of confusing. And so in the show notes, I'll have a couple of different pages. One is called Joseph Smith Translated the Plates with the Yerman Thummim. And what I give you are firsthand historical accounts of how he talked about translating it with the Urim and Thummim, not just by Joseph, but by others, Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, and David Whitmer. Those are probably the three closest, that and Emma, to the translation process. They testify that before the loss of the 116 pages, Joseph is using that as the tool or the method. After the loss of the 116 pages, Uh, The accounts that I have that I've gathered in my studies, the firsthand accounts and witnesses say that Joseph Smith used the seer stone. And this is where history can be kind of confusing. When the enemies of the church say Joseph looked in a hat and he translated the whole Book of Mormon with a seer stone, as someone who likes to study history, I say, well, it's really not that cut and dry. After the loss of the plates, and then when he gets them back, that's probably a fair assessment. Prior to that, he did use the Yermum Thummim. Now, in the translation process, how much of this was he part of this process? I think Joseph's playing a role in this process as well, but it's complicated. But just know, like anything, history is messy. I like to say that a lot. And this is happening. And so is Joseph translating by the Yermum Thummim? My first question is, well, what do you mean by Yermum Thummim? 
stone in a hat? I would say yes, after the 116 pages are lost. But before, he's using the tool that the Lord gave him. And so that's a little bit on translation. Well, clearly Joseph plays a role, role here because when Oliver tries to do it, it he fails. So you, it's not interchangeable. You, it, 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 Joseph does do something. Yeah. And what's significant is all of these comments about how the book was translated are coming to us from people who were there but aren't necessarily putting their head in the hat. The only person who really knows how the book was translated never said anything. The only thing Joseph ever said was what he wrote in the title page of the original version of the Book of Mormon, which was simply, I translated this by the gift and power of God. That's the only firsthand account from Joseph. Everything else is coming to us from another account. David Whitmer, Emma, Oliver, people who were there but weren't necessarily doing the translation. On one occasion in 1831, um, they were at a kind of a conference and they Hiram suggested that maybe Joseph should tell the brethren how the Book of Mormon was translated. And Joseph stood up and said the following, that it was not intended to tell the world all the particulars of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and also said that it was not expedient for him to relate these things. I don't think that he's hiding anything or that he can't tell us. I just don't think we would fully understand the whole process. And I would remind everyone, I would remind believer and non-believer, that long ago God said that this book would be a marvelous work and a wonder. It came forth, not in a logical, understandable process that we can fully explain and articulate. It was a marvelous work and a wonder. And of that I testify, however it came forth. And the one thing that everyone acknowledges is that the dictation period took around 60 to 70 days and that he didn't use any outside material. It was done in the presence of multiple witnesses and that not once did Joseph ever go back and read what, was go- what he had said previously in order to correct something that he was saying now. Now, you contrast that with someone like J.R.R. Tolkien who had decades to write the Lord of the Rings trilogy who was an English professor, who had a PhD, who made multiple revisions. Joseph Smith, 23 years old, without an education, produces a nearly 600-page book in a dictation period that lasts 60 days. He doesn't use any outside material, and he doesn't go back and correct any of the material. He doesn't go back and change, well, what did I say 200 pages ago? And yet there is in this book an incredible consistency and connection. You cannot brush off the translation period. You can criticize it. You can say, well, it seems funny that he put a head in his head in a hat. But you cannot brush this off. How a 23-year-old produced a 600-page book in a dictation period of 60-plus days without making major revisions. That actually makes it harder if my head's in a hat trying to write something. Yeah. <laughs> I just think you're just, you just made it more difficult. The degree of difficulty just shifted. So Yeah. Yeah. So either he's making this book up on the fly, a 600-page book that he's making up on the fly without making any revisions, or he's previously written it. And he has to memorize eight pages and stick his head in a hat every day and dictate what he's memorized, or he's doing exactly what he claims to be doing. And it's coming to him through a divine process that we may not fully understand, and it's done by the gift and power of God. Yeah. Of those three, I'll bet my life on the last one. Yeah. I remember as a young man having an experience reading the Book of Mormon and being filled with light. And it's very difficult for me to describe, but I know that there is divinity in it. What's interesting to me is how often that experience is repeatable as I've read the text in my life, how it's filled my life with light. And it's manifest in all kinds of different ways, but I just want to bear witness that as I read these words, they come from heaven. So after the introduction talks about the translation process, and again, the only thing the introduction says is that Joseph translated them by the gift and power of God, the very next paragraph. So this, Where are is, you? The, this is the introduction, one, two, three, four, five, sixth paragraph okay. of the introduction. Joseph Smith said, quote, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth, 
and the keystone of our religion, and that a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Most correct book on earth, get closer to God by reading it than any other book, and then he says it's the keystone of our religion. Now, I know as you study this week, you're going to read a lot about keystones and what they are, and they're the very top of the arch, but how is the Book of Mormon the keystone of our religion? President Benson said three ways. Number one, it's the keystone of our testimony of Christ. And I would give everyone an assignment. Write down everything you know about Christ, and then cross out everything that is only taught in the Book of Mormon, not in the Bible. And you are going to be shocked at how much you believe in Christ that comes through the Book of Mormon. For example, Alma chapter 7 He suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. That is a Book of Mormon doctrine, not so much a Bible doctrine. Most people who have only the Bible think the atonement occurred on the cross, that his suffering was on the cross. It is a Book of Mormon doctrine to help us understand that his suffering occurred in the garden and what he did in the garden. There's a lot in the Bible. But I don't think Latter-day Saints fully appreciate all that we know of Jesus that came through the Book of Mormon. So as you study the Book of Mormon this year, pay attention to unique doctrines of Christ that come to us through the pages of the Book of Mormon. And what you would have to give up if you rejected the Book of Mormon, you have to give up Jesus as taught in the Book of Mormon. The second thing President Benson mentions about uh, being a cornerstone is it's the cornerstone of our doctrine. Make a list of doctrines that are taught primarily in the Book of Mormon. I'll give you one major doctrine that you'll find almost absent in the Bible, and that is the doctrine of the fall. The Bible does not teach the doctrine of the fall, but the Book of Mormon very clearly teaches the need for and the purpose of the fall and how the atonement balances the fall. There are so many doctrines that come to us by way of the Book of Mormon. It's the keystone of our doctrine. But then the third thing is, it's the keystone of our testimony. And President Benson goes on to say, do you understand the role the book plays in our testimony? Because the reality is, if the Book of Mormon is true, then Joseph Smith was a prophet. It proves the validity and the calling of the prophet Joseph Smith. And if Joseph Smith was a prophet, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true. And if the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true, then its doctrines and practices and current leaders are also divinely inspired by God. And if the book is true, then Jesus is the Christ. So, for example, that's how you could solve almost every problem. Let's suppose there's a Christian group out there that believes that the Sabbath day is Saturday. And for 4,000 years, the Sabbath day was Saturday. But we believe that when the resurrection occurred on Sunday, that the Sabbath day switched and that all of Christianity then switched the Sabbath day to Sunday. But how would you then prove to anyone who believed a Christian denomination that believed that the Sabbath day was Saturday? There's very little in the Bible to prove it. So what would you do? Well, is the Book of Mormon true? If the Book of Mormon's true, then Joseph Smith was a prophet. And if Joseph Smith was a prophet then section 59 is true and inspired, in which the Lord calls Sunday the Sabbath day. So the one way, not that we're after proving, but if you want to establish the truth of any Latter-day Saint doctrine or practice or leader or key, you just simply have to read the Book of Mormon and come to a knowledge that the Book of Mormon is true. If the Book of Mormon is true, then there was a restoration. And if there was a restoration, that means there was an apostasy. And if there was an apostasy, it means the authority was lost on earth. It is the keystone of our testimony. And we need to understand that it all comes down to, is the Book of Mormon true? So people can criticize the church all they want. And apostates often criticize our doctrine, which is foolish. If you want to destroy the church, all you have to do is prove that the Book of Mormon is false. But it's easier to attack doctrine than attack the Book of Mormon because the Book of Mormon is its nearly impossible to prove that it's false. You'd have to prove that Joseph Smith wrote it, and there is so much evidence that he didn't write it. And so 
anytime anyone attacks a doctrine, it really boils down to, is the Book of Mormon true? Because if the Book of Mormon's true, then the doctrine the Book of Mormon establishes, or the doctrine established by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which was established by Joseph, who translated the Book of Mormon, is true as well. It is the keystone of our testimony. All right, now that leads us to witnesses, Mike. So why don't you take the witnesses? So historically, not everybody saw it the way Bryce sees it. For example, there are people that believe the Book of Mormon to be true, but maybe they struggle with the doctrine or maybe a practice. We certainly know in 1838, there were a bunch of members that they loved the Book of Mormon, but they didn't like what was happening in the church and they left. One of those was a guy by the name of David Whitmer. In fact, of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon, and you can read their testimonies, there's three of them. There's Martin Harris, David Whitmer, and Oliver Cattery. I find it fascinating that all three in the 1838 apostasy left the church. Now, if you think about this from a logical standpoint, let's just say that these three witnesses who said they saw an angel and they saw the plates, uh, they and Joseph, it was just all made up and it was kind of this big deception. Then now's your chance to come out and say, hey, Joseph was just making it up. Now's your whistleblower chance. And we see whistleblowers all the time. Yeah. Usually when someone leaves an organization, they blow the whistle on that organization. Yeah. It happens all the time. Yeah. And, and they didn't. They didn't uh, recant their testimony. And In the, fact, to the opposite, yeah. they adamantly hold to their testimony. Even, even David Whitmer, who never came back, he called 22 witnesses towards the end of his life to vouch for his character. He swore an oath to them that he saw what he saw, that he is, in fact, telling the truth. Yeah. So in 1888, he bore witness of this. He was the most interviewed witness to the text of the Book of Mormon, and he died on January 25th, 1888, when he was 84. So if you think about it, the Book of Mormon comes forth in 1829, published to the world 1830. So it's almost 60 years after the time when he witnessed the plates. And on Sunday evening, January 22nd, at half past five, he called his family together and he had someone there to profess that he was of sound mind. He said, Dr. Buchanan, I want you to say whether or not I am in the right mind before I give my last testimony. And the doctor said, yes, you're in your right mind, for I have had a conversation with you. Then David Whitmer said the following, now you must all be faithful in Christ. I want to say to you all that the Bible and the record of the Nephites are true. So you can say that you've heard me bear my testimony on my deathbed. And so... That's it. That was his testimony. He bore witness that the record of the Nephites or the Book of Mormon was true as well as the Bible. And what I find fascinating about this is, like I said, David Whitmer, he left the church, but he never came back. Two of the other three witnesses are Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris. Both of them left the church, but later uh, came back and, and died in full fellowship in the church. Now, like I said, history is messy. And everybody has reasons for why they struggle in faith and especially working with a young organization and young prophets and, and members. And we're not going to get into the weeds on that right now, but just know that these three witnesses that saw the record and heard the angel, they died bearing witness that it was true. And if anyone had a bone to pick or to say, hey, I didn't see this, it would be one of those three men. And so that being said, like I said, I, ha I have a, a spiritual witness of it, of the Book of Mormon. For me, this is a matter of faith. But I really do appreciate that the Lord understands that we live in a secular environment where it seems like evidence is king. Now, as much as the Lord loves evidence and as much as he wants us to go to the light, he's never going to intellectually compel us to believe. He's not going to put all the evidence on one side. In other words, the Lord's going to give us enough evidence, but really the evidence is the spirit that's manifest as we read the text and as we try to apply the principles. We've covered just a little bit in this podcast, but I want to just reiterate what Bryce said about the nature of who God is, is manifest throughout the pages of the Book of Mormon, especially, and it's not so much you know for us today, but in Joseph Smith's day, there was a common notion in 19th century America that there were those that were elect that God has chosen, and they're going to be saved, and there's those that God has elected or chosen to be damned, and there's nothing we can do about this. And that just violated every piece of Joseph Smith's soul. He was just like, that's just wrong. And Brigham Young later said something to the effect of, if you take away my agency, you take away my identity. Agency is who I am. We are agents. And that's something that really resonates with the Book of Mormon, this idea that we have agency. 
and that what we do can cause us to lose the light. In other words, we play a role in our salvation. And with the Bible as a standalone text, there are a lot of Christians that don't see that. And that comes out of fifth century Augustinian theology, where he kind of talked about this notion of predestination and God's chosen who will be saved. But the Book of Mormon cuts against that grain, that what we do matters. And I just want to bear testimony to that too, that your decisions and your actions do matter. And I think the Book of Mormon really hits home with that, as we'll see as we go through the text. So that's a little bit on the witnesses, a little bit on translation. So that's all I brought today for this on the introduction, Bryce. Just one more thing, and I think this week on the introduction pages and the witness statements needs to end with you. The whole idea is, okay, I see that Joseph had witnesses of the plates and that saw the angel, and then he had eight more witnesses of the plates. But you need to become a witness. The whole point of this introduction, I think, is to say, will you be a witness of the Book of Mormon? And so let me give you a couple thoughts of fuel for your own witness. We're going to get to Alma chapter 32, where Alma invites us to make an experiment with the Word. And that experiment is to try it, give place. And those of you who have given place to the Book of Mormon, Alma says, here's how you'll know if the seed is a good seed. I'm in Alma 32, verse 28. If you plant it, if you will take time to give place, one or more of four things are going to happen. If it's a good seed, number one, it will swell within your breasts. You'll feel a swelling. And I know a lot of critics are critical of that, so let's add the other three. If the Book of Mormon is true, it will enlarge your soul. It will make your soul bigger. You will grow. In other words, try the book and see if it makes you a better person. That to me, brothers and sisters, is the greatest evidence of the book. Not so much a feeling that I get when I read it, but the change that comes over me and the people I watch read the book. That book changes lives. Read it and watch how it changes your life. I have had a front row seat to thousands of Latter-day Saint youth who begin to fall in love and read that book, and I have watched for 27 years the changes that that book causes. If the book has changed you, if it's enlarged your soul, don't you have to conclude that the seed is a good seed? It's not a dud. Number three from Alma, it will enlighten your understanding. Read the book and see if it just makes sense. See if it just connects dots in a way that no other book will connect. And that's what I love about the Book of Mormon. It just makes sense. And the last one Alma mentions, it will be delicious. If the book is true, it will be delicious. And you'll want to come back to it again and again and again. Of that, I testify, if you have tried the book, and if it swelled within your breast, if it enlarged your soul and made you a better person, if it made sense and enlightened your understanding, and if it became delicious unto you, God now calls on us to witness of the book for ourselves. Now, let me ask you, if 10 people see a crime and not one of them are willing to say what they saw, how many witnesses are there? Ten or none? Is seeing the crime making you a witness? I would suggest no. That crime has zero witnesses. Ten people saw the crime, but not one person was willing to say what happened. We become a witness when we are willing to stand up and say, I know this seed is a good seed. And so let me be very clear where Bryce Dunford stands. This is a good seed. I know it. It has swelled my breasts. It has made me a better person. It has enlightened my understanding. It has become so delicious to me. And I invite you to be a witness of it. So with that, we thank you for listening. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe. And if you haven't already, go check out our YouTube channel called Talking Scripture. 
On that channel, Bryce and I have been working on some new video content. These new videos are in addition to the regular podcasts that Bryce and I do together and supplements to your Come Follow Me study. And we'll leave a link in the description. Once again, thanks for joining us and make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.